We all rely on artificial intelligence in our daily lives. Whether it's Siri, Google Maps, or Netflix recommendations, we use AI all the time. But did you know it's also transforming eye care and ophthalmology? In our next episode of the IQ podcast, Dr. James Sai explores how AI is revolutionizing eye care from di advanced diagnostics to research to personalized treatments. Curious about what's next for your vision with the power of AI? Tune in to this week's episode of the IQ podcast and find out how AI is shaping the future of eye health. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to the IQ podcast. I am so excited to bring this episode to you today and our special guest for this week. Our special guest expert is Dr. James Sai. Dr. Sai is a graduate of Amherst College and an alumnus of the Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Sai completed his residency in ophthalmology at the Doheny Eye Institute at the University of Southern California, followed by glaucoma fellowships at the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute at the University of Miami and at Moorfields Eye Hospital and the Institute of Ophthalmology in London. Dr. Sai also received a master's degree in business administration from Vanderbilt University. Dr. Sai is currently president of New York Eye and Ear Infirmary of Mount Sinai, as well as professor and system chair of ophthalmology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Amongst his many accolades and roles, Dr. Sai serves as the founding director of the Center for Ophthalmic Artificial Intelligence and Human Health at the Icon School of Medicine. I'm so excited to welcome to the IQ podcast, Dr. James Sai. Thank you so much, Dr. Sai, for joining us. It's truly an honor to have you here. And it's truly an honor for me to participate and, and talk with you about ophthalmic artificial intelligence today. Yeah, I'm so, I've been really looking forward to this interview. I'm so excited to learn from you and to have you share your wealth of knowledge. But I would love to begin by asking you to please share your background about how, as an ophthalmologist, you first got interested in artificial intelligence and specifically artificial intelligence as it pertains to eye health. Well, I first got into, uh, involved and interested in ophthalmic artificial intelligence about five or six years ago when some of our researchers in our department were really coming to me with exciting advances that they had made in their fields. Some of them were looking at using AI to predict changes in the visual field in glaucoma, progression of glaucoma. Others were looking at using AI or AI guided tools to, cha to tell changes in macular degeneration. That is so interesting. So it was through your the work that other uh, ophthalmic re researchers are doing at New York Eye and and Mount Sinai that you became interested. So how did you come upon this concept of founding the Center for Artificial Intelligence, ophthalmic artificial intelligence? Great question. And the reason is that as I, as I was seeing everyone coming to me and saying, gosh, I've got this exciting project. I really would love the department support. I realized that it would be wonderful to form a center where we shared all our collective knowledge and our understanding of AI. Plus Mount Sinai at the time, um, the Dean made a bold move to create one of the first departments of artificial intelligence in any medical school in the country. And their focus was human health. And so my thought was, we really need to form a center for ophthalmic artificial intelligence that has an impact for human health. And that's why human health is part of the center's name. Oh, beautiful. So you're both truly visionaries, both yourself as well as the Dean at Mount Sinai. Um, so what does the center entail? Like, do you have like a team that you're working with? Do you have, yes. uh, you know, on uh, the on the other the, sort of the back end, you know, do you have programmers, software developers that you're working with? How does it all come together? It all comes together because as co-directors, we have two wonderful AI scientists, Dr. Luis Pasquale, who directs our Eye and Vision Research Institute, and Dr. Alan Harris, who actually is an AI researcher and is actually on the editorial board of one of the leading journals uh, in ophthalmic artificial intelligence. So both of them drive the science I'm trying um, as primarily more a clinician to make sure that the research gets enveloped in how we see patients, 
how we practice medicine. Mm-hmm. And so we're forming a team. We're raising money. We're actually uh, hoping to start an AI clinical fellowship in ophthalmology so we can teach uh, future uh, leaders in ophthalmic AI. Wow, that is phenomenal. So does any, as far as you know, does any other eye department have something like this? Or is this really kind of the first of its kind, like the the founding center in the world for AI and ophthalmology? I think we're one of the first in the country, though there are other departments that have noticed that this is a very good idea. And so we're excited that we're spurring the growth of a lot of ophthalmic AI centers around the country. Mm-hmm. I think that we're on the leading edge because we are not focused just on one particular area. In fact, uh, as you know, Dr. Bannock, uh, neuro-ophthalmology is such a critical part of ophthalmology. And Dr. Mark Coopersmith and you and his group are working on ways to really use AI to demonstrate when optic nerves have mm-hmm. papal edema. And so there was a recent publication that just came out. So this is all exciting because it makes it so that diseases can be detected earlier. And so hopefully uh, we can are able to treat patients um, earlier in the disease. So, I mean, we've, you've talked a little bit about glaucoma. You've talked a little bit about neuro-ophthalmology, papilledema. What are some other um, applications for AI in diagnosis of ophthalmic disease or early diagnosis of ophthalmic disease? Certainly one of the areas where AI has great potential is, our retina, is retinal diseases. So retinal diseases in terms of diabetic retinopathy, So we are working with primary care physician offices throughout the Mount Sinai health system where a patient gets a non-dilated, you don't have to put drops in the eye, uh, what we call a non-midriatic fundus photograph. So with the photograph, we can screen for diabetic retinopathy, diabetic retinal disease, as well as look for other potential blinding diseases. Also, we can start using certain features of macular degeneration, which can be detected via fundus photography to perhaps uh, start making predictions about whether patients are more risk at of cardiovascular disease and have an increased risk of stroke. Oh, all of that seems like it would you know, really put patient care at the forefront and really help to expedite diagnosis, including getting primary care doctors or non-ophthalmologists, non-eye care providers involved in monitoring for some of these potentially blinding diseases. Um, so when you, when you develop a model for AI diagnosis of a disease, like how long does it take to validate that? Like how many data points do you need before you can reliably have AI um, help and aid in the diagnosis? That's a great question. So far, most of our AI uh, undertakings initiatives have been more research focused because it does take uh, multiple studies to validate the technology. And I see AI as really augmenting the decision-making of ophthalmologists and physicians rather than replacing ophthalmologists and physicians. So it's an incredibly useful tool that we can harness in the future. Oh, that's really good to hear because I know, you know, as computers play more and more, you know, uh, digital devices, et cetera, play more and more a role in our lives, we all have to worry about job security a little bit. And it's great to hear that, you know, that this is being developed as a tool to augment and not replace eye care providers. I think that, you know, some of us are a little bit nervous about that. Um, So can you give some specific examples where AI, perhaps in your experience, maybe in your practice, you've used it to the benefit of managing some of your patients, maybe particularly with glaucoma? I think a lot of it is in in patient instruction, uh, patient uh, knowledge. Oftentimes I will ask patients if you, you know, Google these or use AI to come up with what a treatment plan is compared to what I've recommended. I do tell them that one of the things that AI can't do, in my opinion, is individualized therapy. Mm -hmm. AI takes a lot of collective knowledge and essentially maybe gives patients probabilities. Only I, as the physician, can individualize their therapy because I understand the history of the patient. 
we know that studies have shown that with the latest um, chat GPT-4 that, and we published on this in our work, um, chat GPT-4 does as well as glaucoma specialists and retina specialists in our department in perhaps, you know, answering questions, knowledge questions, as well as formulating treatment plans. However, I don't think that AI can replace that individualized therapy treatment plan that physicians provide. And therefore, um, AI, I think, is useful as a tool, but won't replace us. And that is something that I keep on stressing to my colleagues and our trainees. Mm -hmm. So just to put this kind of in a a day-to-day, like practical scenario. So let's say you have a patient coming in with uh, these particular risk factors, you know, this uh, amount of optic nerve cupping, this range of eye pressure. Could you enter that into, let's say, chat GPT or another model? Um, and then it will give you kind of the recommendations for what is the next best course of treatment, whether it be observation alone, whether it be perhaps starting the patient on an eye drop, whether it be recommending a laser, for example, like would that, would that be something that, you know, we can all look forward to as eye care providers or something that you do regularly right now? I think in the future, I don't do it regularly. What I uh, use it is to have the patients reassure themselves that my treatment plan makes sense. So they can enter it themselves uh, and, use AI to come up with, quote unquote, a version of a treatment plan, compare it against mine. I think that allows patients to feel more comfortable that my treatment plan is very consistent with what an AI generated algorithm. Mm-hmm. And I do so think it's like a, a validation that yeah. your patients are getting uh, or, or, or even like a virtual second opinion, right? That almost sounds like, you know, they can type into chat GPT, what should I do? And then it's, it's you know, spits out, <laughs> do this, this, and this. <laughs> Absolutely correct. It, it, I think it gives them comfort, especially when I'm recommending either the additional, additional medical therapy or surgery, glaucoma surgery. Mm-hmm. gives them um, a potentially impartial second opinion from um, AI to compare. And, and I oftentimes ask them to come in to see me afterwards where we can discuss uh, where maybe we're eye to eye similar, <laughs> eye to eye in terms mm-hmm. of similarities in terms of treatment plan, but maybe in, uh, situations where there's some differences, I can explain why I'm particularly going uh, in a one way, whereas AI may recommend another treatment option. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so one, one of the concerns that I would have as an eye care provider is whether if a patient types in something into chat GPT or another AI system, and the outcome that they get, is that truly accurate? Because I know I've sometimes experimented, I've plugged in something and I know that AI is what it's giving me back is actually not valid. It's not based on anything that's actually scientific. So how do you deal with that? You know, yes, patients may want to do their own investigation, but what if it's actually not correct? Like what if it's, I've even had AI sometimes make up um, uh, references that you know, scientific references that don't exist. You know, just when I'm playing around with things, and that's quite scary, actually, um, in my mind. So, how do you how do you kind of balance that out? You know, from a patient point of view, I encourage them to come back and see me, and we can talk about what they have generated. And I totally agree with you. AI does um, sometimes get it wrong. Uh, there's there's not that knowledge that AI has. AI is simply just taking everything that's been published. Now, the the publications may not be uh, validated in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And and that's where we as specialists can provide that oversight to ensure that the information is accurate. You're absolutely correct. In the legal field, there have been cases where AI made up, you know, 
uh, facts that were incorrect. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we're still at the fo at the forefront of this revolution, but the revolution does have some kinks that have to be worked out. And that's where we as specialists can provide that assurance to patients. Yeah, I wonder if it's possible. I mean, it, it is a big project. It would be a lot of work, but for specialists or experts in a particular field to create a separate database that is scientifically validated and then to send patients to that database rather than to all of the internet, um, that may be a potential solution. But again, that would be something that would be a huge endeavor <laughs> to create yes. something yeah. like that. Or maybe we could use AI to create something like that. <laughs> I think I think that that's a great suggestion. AI could probably uh, give us more quantitative analysis and then we and then we as experts can then oversee the creation of that database. OK, yeah. So it's it's really exciting, the future of AI and ophthalmology. Welcome back, everyone. We've been chatting with Dr. James Sai about the use of AI. And so far, we really focused on clinical practice. Now, um, Dr. Sai, I wanted to just ask you about uh, using AI from a research perspective. What are some of the, the major research projects that are going on right now when it relates to eye care and the use of AI? So the major research projects in our department include trying to understand better the relationship between the cardiovascular system and the ocular system. So one of our researchers, Dr. Alon Harris, is really trying to come up with mathematical models of the eye, ocular circulation system and really gain insight into whether that can predict um, changes in the cardiovascular system. Another researcher, Dr. Ted Smith, has been working on research to demonstrate that certain forms of macular degeneration may well predict uh, increased risk of stroke, cardiovascular stroke. We are also working with the Department of Neurology to see whether um, some of the AI um, interpretation of fundus photos may predict uh, the onset of neurologic disease, such as Alzheimer's disease, as well as maybe uh, make predictions whether those patients are more likely to benefit from some of the new uh, medications for Alzheimer's disease. So a lot of great research going on, and I think there'll be more to come. This is the future, I believe, of AI research in human health is through the eye, through ophthalmology. I tell my colleagues, there's no other specialty in medicine where you can view, visualize the cardiovascular system and visualize the central nervous system through the optic nerve. Yeah, those are such important points and such fascinating research topics. I, al I always tell my patients, the eye is really a window to your overall health. And you know that's why it's so important to get your annual eye exam, because we can pick up conditions like hypertension, diabetes, and sometimes even risk for stroke based off of a dilated fundus exam. So now your take, you and your team are really taking it to the next level where you're using um, ophthalmic diagnostics to perhaps predict systemic disease, which is amazing, phenomenal. Um, when do you think this is all going to really um, kind of be be widely accepted? Like uh, some of these research projects that are going on in the department, how long does it take to, um, you know, carry it through to completion? Is it a few years? Is it five years, 10 years, you know, to amass all that those data points and then to really make those connections with systemic health? I would say next three to five years is going to be incredible advances. Uh, I also point out that I believe in the future, when you go to see your primary care physician, besides the primary care physician's office getting blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, there'll be a fundus photograph, a picture of your retina without dilation, and there will be a AI read of what we can tell from that retina photograph. That will actually be part of what we call vital signs. I really think, um, as you pointed out, that it is the window to your health and therefore it's gonna be part of your annual, let's say um, vital signs that are obtained. 
Yeah, I look forward to that. I mean, I, you know, I think it would really improve the health outcomes of so many individuals to get an early diagnosis and intervention before it becomes a problem. I think that's also the key here is some of these um, findings may be very subtle and perhaps may even be missed by humans, by your eye care provider. But with um, AI driven technology, we can pick up such minute, minute variations that again, may be a predictor of future issues. Um, so I wanted to shift a little bit now and perhaps talk about the use of AI when it comes to global eye care. Um, could you speak to that a little bit? Like, has it been used? Is it being used? Is it being planned to be used to improve the out health um, outcomes or eye care outcomes of people around the world, perhaps in areas that are underserved? I know that my colleagues internationally are really researching this. Uh, they see enormous uh, potential in using AI. Uh, obviously, the number of patients being screened, uh, AI does make it much easier to detect um, conditions, let's say, on retina fundus photographs. Also, um, some organizations such as Orbis have been using kind of tele-ophthalmology. Um, and I see AI as being um, combined with remote monitoring, tele-ophthalmology to provide care to rural and underserved communities in a way that uh, has, can transform medicine. Also, I think that AI can transform and help lead to greater health equity in the United States. There are underserved regions where or, or patients have difficulty getting transportation, where if we can bring some of these tools into the primary care office, we may be able to detect disease earlier and then hopefully have op opportunities to bring specialists to the primary care office so that patients don't have to travel. I think it's a, a important way that we can actually improve health access and enhance health equity. Oh, that's that's so important that you pointed that out. Um, so not just around the world, but even in our own country, um, there are you know part, huge parts of the country that don't have enough eye care providers, whether they're ophthalmologists or optometrists. And using AI to fill in those gaps, perhaps detect some optic nerve cupping, which could be an early indicator of glaucoma, or perhaps detect drusen, which is an early indicator of macular degeneration. Um, it would really again, improve the outcome and provide health equity. So something to look forward to. Um, so I know we've talked, you know, we've talked about a, a variety of different topics when it comes to AI. Dr. Sai, with your experience, your, your background in this, in this emerging field, where do you think this is really going to take us, let's say, going out into the future in the next 10 years or even the next 20 years? Um, what are some really innovative aspects of AI that, that could impact our field? I do think, and we've talked, touched on this, that AI, especially ophthalmic AI, could really start playing a role in helping with cardiovascular disease, um, neurological disease, even uh, renal disease, where your primary care physician, armed with the insights from some of these AI interpretations of fundus photographs, can actually use that and incorporate it into predicting and, and you know, risk of certain strokes and then modulating or modifying the therapy to reduce that risk. So I do think ophthalmic AI is gonna be really part of determining uh, human health. And that mm -hmm. is my vision. Also, I do think that hopefully we'll have much fewer misdiagnoses, that with AI, there will always be a way just similar to what, what is happening in radiology these days, where if there's a subtle finding, AI will oftentimes also point that out. So we'll have fewer misdiagnoses mm -hmm. uh, in interpretation of scans, in interpretation of visual fields, in interpretation of even symptoms that AI will be running in the background of some of our electronic health records so that when we enter certain symptoms, there will be quote unquote algorithms, which we, we as physicians can 
either accept or we can actually read it and say, no, no, that's not quite um, this patient's um, condition, but at least we will be alerted that this may be a possible uh, diagnosis on that differential diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. That's, that's again, something to really look forward to. Um, currently, I know that there are, in terms of um, the equipment, there are some commercial, um, commercially available handheld devices, which um, can be used in various different types of settings, whether it's the emergency department or in primary care doctor's offices. And these devices, these uh, handheld fundus photography cameras are relatively easy to use. Um, they, Some of them do have the AI algorithms built in. Do you ever see something like that being available for commercial use for individuals to maybe monitor themselves? Like you have your handheld fundus camera at home and then you take pictures of yourself every six months or do your whole family send it into your eye doctor, do you ever see that becoming a reality? Yeah, great um, question. Yes, I do. That's, you're very perceptive. Yes, I, I think that there will be a whole host of ways that we monitor our own eye health. And some of them will have uh, AI algorithms attached to it. Certainly, those images can be transmitted to your provider's office. And there'll be a lot of remote monitoring. As I mentioned, mm -hmm. AI really fits well with this concept of getting care even without traveling to the physician's office. Remote monitoring seems to be the way of the future for healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously, if you need to come in for certain procedures or certain diagnosis, diagnostic visits, that's going to be critical. But mm -hmm. some of the routine follow-up checkups may be done from the comfort of your own home. Mm -hmm. Which again also expands health equity, yes. um, and it decreases the need for travel and, and taking time off from work. Those inconveniences that can sometimes come with close monitoring. Um, again, something I look forward to. I know already that there are some home monitoring devices available in the ophthalmic space. Um, for example, there's an intraocular pressure monitor that can be used at home and electronically sends the data to your um, to your eye care provider so they can monitor. Um, so. It's amazing where this is all taking us. And, and it's also reassuring to know that, you know, as an eye care provider, we will not get fully replaced. Our, all of these tools, all of these, you know, adaptations, these technologies will only improve our ability to deliver better, uh, more efficient eye care. So that's also very, very reassuring. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Sai, for speaking with us today on the IQ podcast. Um, are there any kind of last uh, words or comments or thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with about today's discussion? I just li like to leave the audience with a thought, you know, please keep abreast of all the findings and don't feel fear AI. I think that AI can assist in the care of, of your condition uh, in the future. Uh, stay knowledgeable. AI can make you incredibly knowledgeable. You can use AI as a tool, as we've discussed, to get a, a almost a second opinion um, and, and provide additional insight into your condition. Well, thank you for that. That's so, so, so important to keep that perspective in mind. Well, thank you, Dr. Sai, for joining us today. Um, if anyone wanted to learn more about um, the center at Mount Sinai for uh, ophthalmic intelligence, um, artificial intelligence, how can they um, learn more, reach out, um, and perhaps even contribute or donate? Well, that's a great question. And it's very simple. Just You can just put in your search engine, ophthalmic AI, Mount Sinai. And there is a page for our Center for Ophthalmic Artificial Intelligence and Human Health. And it provides more information about the exciting research that we're doing, as well as the transformative care that we hope to deliver here at Mount Sinai. Well, thank you for that. And thank you again, Dr. Sai, for taking the time to speak with us. I know you have a very busy schedule, so we appreciate your knowledge and your, um, and your time. So thank you.